Okay. Hey, Ron. How are you? Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Douglas. I'm great. Oh, my pleasure. So I was reading through your bio and, you know, I think this is going to be a little bit out of my league. I mean, astrophysics is not my forte particularly. So maybe we'll keep it on kind of a simple level rather than a, you know, PhD level. Um, tell me a little bit. <laughs> tell me a little bit about your background first, then we'll pivot over to your book. Yeah, speaking of which, yeah, the book is really uh, mostly uh, I write about people. Um, so I, I don't have a degree in astrophysics. In fact, I got two degrees in music and literature from the University of Denver. Um, yeah, so I, I, I embarked on this uh, uh, really after I found Milton Humason, just out of curiosity. I've always been interested in the stars and astronomy, and I was reading a book about the Big Bang. And uh, this guy jumped out of the page at me, this Milton Humason guy. He's a eighth grade educated mule scanner, cowboy, citrus rancher. And at the age of 31 became a, 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 um, an astronomer at this, at this world renowned uh, astronomical facility. And 10 years later, he's having his picture taken with uh, Edwin Hubble and Einstein having just proved Einstein incorrect about the fact that the universe was expanding. So it wasn't a story I could put down. And uh, being uh, curious about it, I have uh, published a couple of books about it. Well, so the book that you've got out now, I mean, is this mm -hmm. about him or how does it how does it work? Yeah, good question. So the first book came out, that was his biography, Humason's biography that came out on Springer biographies in 2015, the end of 2015. That book really uh, delved into his personal life, where he grew up, et cetera, and, you know, really kind of pulled out all of the family relations that I could dig up over the course of seven or eight years of research. The second book, in the second book, uh, what I was trying to do there was I realized that Hubble and Humason still hadn't been put on the same page and really with neither could have discovered the expansion of the universe without the other. In other words, Hubble needed Humason as badly as Humason needed Hubble. So um, it felt like the right thing to do. And there's so much to clear up about the record. Um, people have had a lot of claims and counterclaims about the Big Bang. I think it's still in dispute. We don't know, you know, that there actually ever was a beginning. Um, and so, it, it, you know, there are still some, obviously, some some unanswered, more unanswered questions than there are answered questions, frankly. But that was the reason for the second book was just to really, I wanted to make sure that Hubble and Humason ended up on the same. They needed to be on the same, uh, on the same cover, um, talking about the Big Bang. Well, how did Humason get to that league, coming from being a ranch hand? It sounds like. Yeah, it's it's crazy. He's kind of the, you know, uh, for mo movie buffs, he's kind of the goodwill hunting of astronomy. Uh, okay. A bit of a, obviously a bit of a savant. Uh, he was a janitor, he was hired as a janitor in 1917 at the Mount Wilson Observatory. It's his famous observatory outside of Pasadena in California. Uh, and he was a really good storyteller. You know, as I said, he was a moonshiner and poker play, expert poker player. And the guys around the observatory really liked him for all of those reasons. He's just a very earthy kind of guy. And he befriended a few of them. One of them taught him astrophotography, the basics of astrophotography. And that's when he learned that this, this characteristic that he had, he was colorblind really could help him because he had this color blindness that allowed him to see the contrast between black and white with extreme clarity. And so from that point, that was the middle of 1918, really the summer of 1918. And from there, he really started to, his, his life began to change rapidly, he began to learn. Some of the guys started to teach him some of the basics of trigonometry and the things that they used to, you know, uh, compute orbits and things of that nature. And he really picked up on it and really seemed to love it. 
and um, he published his first article in 1919. And as I said, two years later, uh, became a, a member of the a fully fledged member of the observatory staff. Well, he must have been really something because in those days, the technology was pretty primitive. So he didn't have the internet to uh, go searching for. So it was all books. Yeah. And, and the work he was doing was extremely tedious, um, yeah. especially when he started in with, with Hubble. Because these are, you know, in those days, you didn't, you know, drop your coordinates in uh, for a given galaxy and then put your feet up with a cup of coffee and wait for the uh, the results. You He had to drive the telescope and the dome and the platform he was on over, you know, 30, standing 30 feet above a concrete floor for hours and hours and hours, days on end, sometimes a week or more, uh, just to get one get the, the data for one galaxy that he was chasing for Hubble's program. So it was extremely difficult and he got very good at it. Um, in fact, so good that Carl Sagan, a lot of people will, will know that name, Carl Sagan, the great ast astronomer who did the, the Cosmos series back in the 70s, uh, referred to him as the virtuoso of the 100 inch telescope. You know, you mentioned Goodwill Hunting and another movie came to mind while you were talking. I don't know if you've seen it. It's called K-Pax. No. It's um, Kevin Spacey and Jeff Bridges. Okay. And Kevin Spacey plays this kind of savant who is just a genius when it comes to space and stars and he gets put into a mental institution and Jeff Bridges plays the doctor and they it's a good movie you should uh, look yeah, it up it's old it, it, it came out in the 80s um, yeah but it's a sure. it's interesting story anyways let's talk a little bit about the big bang just sure what is it in <laughs> <laughs> can I you can that. you give us There's the uh, the abridged version of that yeah that's what got me going right there what is it and how do we get to this point uh, the Big Bang is apparently, the best we can uh, determine, the beginning of the the beginning of the visible universe, at least as much as far back as we can see it. It's kind of the beginning of space and time as we know it. Um, and it was it was it was first put forth as an idea in the 1920s by a Belgian priest. This guy named Lemaitre, and um, he took Einstein's equations and decided, wait a minute, if I if I'm my calculations are correct, this means that if the, everything is expanding, and I think it is, then that means that at one point in time it was all knotted up into one little ball, and uh, so he and he referred to that as the primeval atom, <laughs> atom in this case, uh, and um, and then it was for, you know, some, it just needed to be, obviously, theory is one aspect of science, and for theory to become more or less uh, doctrine, if you will, uh, there's a lot of experimentation that needs to be done. People have been doing experiments based on Einstein's equation since 1905. But this one was really, really difficult. You're talking about um, reaching very far out into space. And at that point, by the you know, that was 1928, basically. That was only four or five years after Hubble had discovered that there were universes outside the Milky Way. So we're, you know, we're talking about science at the absolute frontier. Um, and um, so, yeah, it was, but that's the Big Bang is, Big Bang is the beginning of, space and time. Did this overlap with Darwinism? Because it seems like it's around the same time period. It's a it's a 60 years or so after uh, uh, Darwin's Darwin's uh, book, 50 years after oh, Darwin's book. Was, OK, right. but but you're right. in you're right in saying that toward the end of the 19th century, there's this massive uh, uh, gr growth period in scientific theory and 
um, technology, and that carries right into, I mean, including the film industry and, you know, the telephone lights, cars, planes, it's all starting to happen. Uh, so it's really accelerating. And a lot of it's, a lot of it anyway, not all of it, but but certainly a lot of it accelerating here in the United States. You know what I was thinking of? I was thinking of the Scopes trial, yeah. which was in the 1920s. Yeah. The Darwin's work and research was actually in what, like the 1870s, somewhere yeah. in there? Yeah, okay. Yeah, he published that book in uh, 67 or 7. I have a copy of the original, actually. <laughs> so well, so does around. the Big Bang Theory sort of contradict creationism? It would, yeah? Well, I yeah, this th this is a tough subject, um, and, and it and it certainly had its detractors, but I, I found it I find it interesting that it was a Belgian piece that a priest that put this uh, idea forward in the first place. It doesn't necessarily contradict it, um, but I, to this point, science hasn't really just you know figured out whether there actually was a beginning. We, we haven't seen back that far. So um, I think the jury's still out. I, I normally land on uh, the idea that science and religion don't play in the same place. To, they, 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 just, they don't belong in the same conversation, really. One, is they both have their uses is kind of the best way to put it. And, um, you know, science is very useful in helping us do things like we're doing today. Um, having a conversation from miles and miles away uh, over a, over a, a couple of computers, um, but science can't answer for uh, us what the actual origins of space and time are. It only has a good idea of some of it, and uh, so where religion I think is is good for a lot of people, and that's why seven or eight and ten, uh, um, eight and ten people around the world believe in some form of religion uh, is with the next stop. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, it, it can't answer it any more, any better than creationism, let's put it that way. Well, Ron, I think on that, we're gonna have to wind this down. We are quickly running out of time. So the book is called Hubble, Hummison and the Big Bang. Uh, has it been released? Yes. Yes, it's out on Springer Praxis. Okay, um, yeah. how's it doing? You getting positive reviews? Yeah, 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 yeah. People can uh, check it out on my website. I have uh, some of the reviews there, uh, ronballer.com. Uh, there are links to uh, where you can buy. You can buy it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, um, just about anywhere you buy books online. You can pick it up. Um, yeah. Great. Well, well, thanks again for coming on the show. This was interesting. I mean, this is a big topic. We can't, we only, you know, brush the surface in 15 minutes, but I think yeah, we gave good. people a good idea of what the book is probably about. So, yeah. okay. Yeah, it's definitely about people. I think uh, anybody who picks it up can learn something about how we got here, which was part of my intention and the guys who, who did it. And there's a lot of mayhem that stirs up in the process. Um, you know, people just even Einstein himself was scratching his head over what uh, Hubble and Hummison were bringing down. So it's uh, it gets kind of fun in there. Okay. Well, best of luck with the book. I hope it does well. Thank you. Appreciate it, Douglas.